They slaughtered 20... A Blade Runner's job is to hunt down replicants. Manufactured humans you can't tell from the real thing. Day 1000 of the Siege of Seattle. The Muslim community demands an end to the army's occupation of mosques. The Homeland Security Bill is ratified. After eight years, British borders will remain closed. That's reserved for members of our prime flight program. You gotta be a 4.2 or over to qualify. Oh, I'm, I'm a 4.2. <laughs> mm -mm. I'm afraid you're actually a 4.183. These days, it often feels like we're living in the prelude to a not-so-distant dystopian science fiction future. My next guest, Cory Doctorow, says science fiction is a barometer for any given moment. Science fiction doesn't predict the world, but the science fiction that's popular in any moment gives you this incredible insight into what's on the world's mind, what its fears and aspirations are for technology. A science fiction author, activist, journalist, and blogger, Corey has a new book out. It's called Radicalized. The book is broken up into four novellas, taking the social, political, technological, and economic issues of our time and imagining them in a not-so-far-off future or reality. From copyright protections to radical privatization, Corey Doctorow offers a provocative analysis of the role that technology plays in our lives and what it means for our future. He also has a lot to say about the newly passed European Copyright Directive and its alarming implications on the internet as we know it. Cory Doctorow, welcome to Intercepted. It's sincerely a real pleasure. Thank you. Do you envision the world that you are creating in this book as something that's happening in the near or distant future? The four novellas are not directly linked. They're not all in the same future, but they're all pretty close by. Each one is not meant to be predictive. Like, I hate the idea that science fiction writers are fortune tellers. As an activist, I have to believe that the future is contestable, right? If it was predictable, I just, like, wouldn't bother getting out of bed. So they're meant to be interventions rather than predictions, things to make people angry or inspired or to take action. So, you know, the first story, Unauthorized Bread, it's about a refugee in subsidized housing where all the appliances are designed to extract maximum revenue from her by making sure she only toasts authorized bread in the toaster and so on. The Belangism cloud had burst, and that meant there was no one answering Salima's toaster when it asked if the bread she was about to toast had come from an authorized Belangism baker, which it had. In the absence of a reply, the paranoid little gadget would assume that Salima was in that class of nefarious fraudsters who bought a discounted Belangism toaster and then tried to renege on her end of the bargain by inserting unauthorized bread with consequences ranging from kitchen fires to suboptimal toast. And if that wasn't bad enough, the hedge funds that own these appliance companies go under because of their financial engineering, and then everything stops working. The toaster wasn't the first appliance to go. That honor went to the dishwasher, which stopped being able to validate third-party dishes the week before when Disher went under. And when they start jailbreaking things, it gets good to them, and they feel like this is they're finally mastering their technology. She tried to search her fridge for Belangism hacks and Belangism unlock codes, but appliances stuck together. KitchenAid's network filters gobbled up her queries and spat back snarky no-results screens, even though Salima knew perfectly well that there was a whole underground economy devoted to unauthorized bread. But then that puts them in harm's way because when the companies come back, then they can detect them with their telemetry, with their analytics. Do you think we'll get in trouble? With the building, I mean? They own the appliances. Salima shrugged. They were getting a share of the money we spent before, for the special bread and soap and so on. But with both companies bankrupt, they won't be expecting any new money. Now... If the companies do ever come back from bankruptcy and still no one here is using their products, Nadifa nodded, that would definitely be trouble. Once those companies come back from bankruptcy, then these people are in harm's way because the telemetry will detect their tinkering. And that's not fictionally. It is literally a felony under Section 12.1 of the DMCA, punishable by a five-year prison sentence, to remove copyright protection systems from digital devices. And so, you know, it's it's meant to, like, make people think harder about the fact that now we have these tamper-resistant, illegal-to-tamper-with systems in our cars and in our pacemakers and voting machines and so on, and that this is spreading very quietly, but throughout 
every piece of technology that we use and making it off limits to security auditors as well. And then there's the story that The Mask of the Red Death, which takes its title from this famous Edgar Allan Poe story. And it's about a rich prepper who's in his bunker with all of his friends. Wait, first explain the, the term prepper. Preppers, people who believe that the end of civilization is coming and they build these spider holes. You know, these, these sometimes they're very luxurious and sometimes it's a, you know, a cavern in the basement. It's a recurring motif in old science fiction. Heinlein loved to talk about people who had, you know, bomb shelters that were lovingly equipped for the future and so on. Before the event, Martin Mars spent a lot of time trying to game it out. Would the collapse be sudden, catching him off guard and unprepared, having to fight his way to his fortress as he escaped from Paradise Valley and into the desert hills? Or would there be some kind of sign, a steady uptick in civil disorder and failures from the official powers that counted down to the day, giving him a chance to plan an orderly withdrawal to Fort Doom? This was important. If Martin spooked and ran for Fort Doom too early, He'd have to slink back to the city and his job after however many days he'd spent bunkered up. Not only would it be humiliating, but it would cost him credibility with the 30, uh, the people he'd invited to survive the apocalypse with him. Once Fort Doom was buttoned up for the duration, he'd need to be a credible leader or he could lose control. Who the fuck knew what would happen next? What's the ultimate fear that is driving the prepper yeah. in your... I try to make it explicit. It's that he sits down and he kind of reasons it out. He says, look, the market is a thing that separates the worthy people from the unworthy people. And as we've had better information systems, we've had things like a, a sort of mating that has made the worthy people even more worthy. No longer does the genetic sport who just has the mutation that makes him into a job creator have to settle for, you know, a doe-eyed milkmaid. He can hunt out his equal somewhere in the world by finding them. And then, and eventually like everyone else becomes kind of redundant, surplus to needs, and we'll use automation to get rid of them. And, but then he reasons, you know, if I were one of those people who were surplus to needs and I woke up one day and figured that that was what was going on, I'd go out and, you know, start building guillotines on the lawns of people like me, right? And so he's kind of done the, the game theory here and said, if I were surplus to requirements, I wouldn't take it lying down. I won't expect anyone else to do it. And so I'm, I'm waiting for them to come for me. Martin knew that the event was coming. The fact was the world just didn't need all those people anymore. And the market had revealed that fact squeezing them into tinier, more uncomfortable places. He wouldn't tolerate it if he was in their shoes. He'd be the first one to build a guillotine. And because he was Martin, it would be an awesome guillotine. So absolutely badass and over-engineered with a turbocharger and a self-sharpening blade. Because that was Martin all the way. It's why Fort Doom was the incredible place it was. This guy has got this whole Mad Max theory about how when civilization collapses, he'll wait for the poors to devour each other, and then he'll emerge and become a kind of warlord with his group of excellent, heavily armed ubermenschen. And what he discovers is that we all have this shared microbial destiny, and that the real heroes of the revolution are the ones who are getting the sanitation working, not the ones hiding in the bunker. But he discovers that by getting cholera. Martin felt his own guts clench, his own bowels turn to water. He had Cipro and other broad-spectrum last-resort antibiotics, but he hadn't replaced them yet this year, and a bunch of them were expiring soon. He'd read that their efficacy would start to fall off a cliff when that happened. After a deliberate bioweapon attack, cholera was one of the fears that kept him up at night. He had lots of guns, but you can't shoot germs. One of the elements that I really loved about Max Brooks, World War Z, the book, yeah. not the the film was a terrible adaptation of that book. And you touch on this, too. And I, th I find it such a rich point of inquiry that if you strip away all of the, the things that make unearned wealth the way that it is in our society, who are the most valuable people here? They're the people that know how to work with their hands, mm -hmm. uh, with their physical labor. And as you you do here as well, it's like, you know, you can be the wealthiest kingpin lawyer in the world. But when the fucking apocalypse comes, like, you're going to be hoping that those contractors that you hire to do stuff on your lawn are around to help you. I mean, that is the reality of we're living in that kind of world now where it's like it could break and a lot of people are going to be in deep shit. They don't even know how to unclog their toilet. 
Yeah, I'm a big fan of this Anglo-Canadian science and political writer, Lee Phillips, who wrote a great book called Austerity Ecology and the Collapse Porn Addicts. That's about this kind of bright green communitarian or socialist future as distinct from the degrowth agenda. He's like, if you if your future starts with getting humanity down to 3 billion people, that's a lot of corpses lying around. And, you know, we know that any event that reduces the population of humanity to 3 billion will create such scars and trauma and disease and what have you, and leave you with with a skeleton crew too small to work the systems, that it could be a tipping point into, you know, centuries of barbarism. The only way to a green future is up and through, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson writes about this, that we should get people into big cities, away from natural habitats, into high density environments where we can share, you know, resources and so on. That's the most efficient future we have. It's trying to counter that pastoral kind of Tory bougie version of the future that like someday we will attain a kind of paradise where we all wear leather aprons and work our small holdings and, you know, and craft through the days. That's a vacation, but it's not a it's not a future. There are those people that take to the extreme, that have their bunkers, that are collecting their medicines and their Bitcoin and their weapons, et cetera. And, but even on, on just a slow growth level, the radical privatization agenda in this society where you have some communities that are going to have privatized firefighting forces, mm -hmm. private security, private access to water supply, mm -hmm. that is the real world now. And in a way, it is the preppers take it kind of to the extreme, but it's already seeping into every aspect of our life, right? You know, Larry Lessig, he talks about the world being influenced by like code, what's technologically possible, law, what's legal, norms, what's lawful, and, and markets, what's profitable. And if you think of like, say, the Mount Pelerin Society as having used those four tools to try and change us, one of the changes has been this normative shift, right? Through market and legal mechanisms, we've arrived at a normative moment in which it can sound reasonable to say, what makes you say that you have the right to clean drinking water if you can't afford it? what entitles you to it. It's a kind of tautological thing. The thing that entitles you to it is affording it. And if you can afford it, you know you're entitled to it. It's this idea that we don't have a shared destiny. Mm. And, you know, that's part of the point of the Mask of the Red Death is that giant mountains of corpses are a public health problem. Like leaving aside all of the ethical questions about giant mountains of corpses, giant mountains of corpses will kill you dead by seeping into the water supply and by, you know, uh, vectorizing all kinds of diseases that emerge in, in rotting flesh and so on. It is not nice to be surrounded by rotting corpses. And I think that, you know, in the like kind of late 20th century, early 21st century climate debate, where we've arrived at, at least among some elites, is this belief that climate change is probably real, but given enough mountaintops and Harrier jets, you can just sort of build a, you know, big fence around your high ground and just crossbreed your children by supersonic jet. All the dying poor people will be so far down the slope that you won't even have to smell them. And this is just clearly wrong, right? Just as like a factual matter, that's not going to be a nice existence. I want to ask you about a couple of companies and uh, and get mm. your read on uh, the role they play in our life and our society, but sure. also like what you think their ultimate end game is. I, I, I want to start with Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. I think you can draw like a little two by two grid like like venture capitalists yeah, yeah. like to draw. And uh, on one axis, you have how much of a control freak the company is. And on the other one, you have how much they want to spy on you. So like, <laughs> you know, Apple, total control freaks. But they don't want to spy on you. They just want you to only like be trapped in their walled garden. Google, totally want to spy on you. Don't care where you are because they figured out how to spy on you wherever you happen to be. Then you have like free and open source software, Ubuntu, GNU Linux. Don't want to spy on you. <laughs> don't care how you do it. Anywhere you want is fine with them. But then, you know, in the worst quadrant is Facebook. Everything has to happen in their walled garden and they're going to watch everything you do. I mean, they figured out how to watch you when you're not in the walled garden, but Facebook's goal is to consume the web, surround it and close it, and then spy on you even more effectively. What do you think about where Twitter is right now? So Twitter's biggest sin is, is its engagement tools, the way that it does recommendations and engagement. It's the same problem with the YouTube algorithm. There is like one reliable way to engage people and that's to make them angry. Now, that said, you know, as an activist tool, there's things I like about Twitter. It is, unlike Facebook, it's linkable. So everything on Twitter can be seen, even if you're not a Twitter follower, everything public on Twitter. You don't have to have a Twitter account. So you can link in and out of Twitter. Now, Twitter has experimented with contracting that over time. The other thing about Twitter is that there are times when your adversaries will be stupid enough to pick fights with you that will allow you to play to their gallery and point out the mistakes in their 
argument, right? It's not an entirely pleasant way to spend your day, but you know, I've been fighting on this new European copyright directive. What you can watch online is likely about to change. That's because of a sweeping overhaul of copyright rules just passed by the European Parliament. And the controversial clause is Article 13. It moves online services copyright liability from the current regime, which is that your users get to post stuff, and if it infringes copyright and someone tells you about it, you have to take it down, to one where you are expected to know a priori what it, whether or not something a user posts is an infringement and block it. So it's filters, right? You're going to have to put up content ID style filters for everything. These are very expensive. Google's content ID filter, which just filters video and just on behalf of a small clutch of rights holders, cost $100 million to build and maintain over the last 10 years. Doing this for all the photos, all the videos, all the rights holders, all the text, all the audio, there's really like five companies in the world that can afford it, and they're all American. So this snuffs out the European tech sector at the stroke of a pen. But, you know, there are lots of other problems with filters. So there are no penalties built into the regulation for people who falsely claim copyright in order to ensure that some things can never be posted. So whether that's being a griefer and just going in and posting the collective works of Shakespeare to make sure no one can ever quote Shakespeare until someone at WordPress or at Twitter goes in and plucks all of those entries out one at a time, or whether that's, you know, the King of Thailand who has previously used copyright claims to take down videos of demonstrators being brutalized by the Thai police, you could stop them before they ever started. You could just upload that and it would never show up. The European Union has said you must make sure that copyright violation doesn't happen. You should make sure that you don't accidentally block things that are copyright infringements. The difference between must and should is pretty obvious. And so there, you're going to get lots of weird situations like, you know, your kid's first steps are video recorded while there's a record playing in the background and the music means that you can't upload the video. Or that demonstration where the police become violent, the canonical photograph of it has a bus ad in the background and Corbis owns the stock art. And so that photo can never be posted. How, how do you think that we're, we're going to be targeted in the future with ads? I mean, what, what, the reason I'm asking mm. that, you know, what, one of the, the things that we discovered uh, a few years ago, I mean, we at The Intercept, when we were looking at Wi-Fi sniffers and MC mm -hmm. catchers, New York City now has these kiosks in the subways. And you can go and you can look, you know, you, they're interactive. You know, you can, yeah. you can figure out where your train is and what's going to be laid. And it's, you know, mapping all that stuff. But also you have the, this offer of, you know, a free Wi-Fi now uh, um, everywhere. And when your device hops on to that mm -hmm. Wi-Fi network, you're giving quite a bit of information to that terminal. And mm -hmm. the question is, where does that data go and what is it, you know, what can it be used for? And the other thing we we, we found when we were, we were playing around with, with, uh, with some toys that the smart people here built, you know, engineers, mm -hmm. that if you walk around and your phone is not connected to a Wi-Fi network, but it is seeking out a Wi-Fi connection, it is broadcasting the entire list. I mean, you know this, but I'm just explaining yeah. the entire list of every network you've ever been on, you know, so it's searching for a hotel in Tokyo, your grandma's, you know, house in, in Vermont and, you know, that your, your work, the cafe you've been at. It tells an enormous amount about you. When you look at the way Minority Report, for instance, took Philip K. Dick's ideas in the Minority Report film, each person is targeted individually with like holographic advertisements sure. catered to them specifically. It greets you by name. How do you see this stuff happening going forward? I don't know how we're going to get targeted, but I have like a theory about how we could fix it. You know, if firms were required to internalize even a small amount of the cost of breaches, they would be a lot more cautious about the data they collected and stored. What could be one of the biggest data breaches ever to hit a major retailer this morning, Home Depot is investigating whether its customers' credit and debit cards were exposed. It's not clear how many stores or shoppers could be involved, but experts say it could be larger than the breach that affected 40 million shoppers at Target last year. Home Depot breached 80 million credit cards and paid 60 cents per breach in the class action settlement. They should have paid like a half of a percent of the total value of all of the real estate holdings of 80 million people. Like there's nothing inevitable about the way that we hoard this data. It's a choice that was taken and it's a choice that could be reversed. And it's a choice that exacts a high cost on the wide society. And that cost could be reversed, could be pushed back onto the people who are exerting it. But we would need evidence-based policy for that to happen. And so I'm not saying, okay, we can't change it until we fix capitalism. But I'm saying that part of the project of fixing capitalism is changing this. And part of the project of changing this is fixing capitalism. There are things that have to run in parallel. And you'll only get so far with 
other kinds of interventions until you fix the way that that markets and inequality are functioning right now. I mean, that, that's such a great challenge to all of us to uh, to end on. Corey Doctor, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Jeremy, it really has been uh, an absolute pleasure. What a treat to meet you and to come up here to The Intercept. Thank you. Cory Doctorow is a science fiction author, activist, journalist, and blogger. He's also the co-editor of Boing Boing. You can find that at boingboing.net. His latest book, which contains four short stories, is called Radicalized. You can follow Cory on Twitter at Doctorow. 